So welcome to the webinar, everyone. Sorry, we had some technical issues. So at the moment, we're using more than one PC with the sound coming from one and the presentation coming from another. <coughs> so I'm Harvey Richardson. I, I work within, for Cray within the Archer of COE in, in EPCC. And what we've done is we put together a presentation where we're going to cover basically some things that have changed in the programming environment on Archer right, probably on the last year or so. So that will be done as a combination of myself and Michael Neff. So the, the idea of the talk is first I'll say something about the center of excellence. I'll talk a bit about upgrades, what kinds of upgrades are there and how do they happen. And there are two kinds of upgrades. There are CLA upgrades and programming environment upgrades. And what we'll do is we'll cover a range of things. We'll cover some basic features that have come along to the, uh, to the environment, uh, as you might have seen things change over the last year or so. Uh, we'll cover some more advanced tuning op uh, options. And in some cases, they might be some quite esoteric things that you might never care about. They're the kind of things where in a particular circumstance for a particular application, some tuning capability of MPI, for example, might be something you're interested in. Uh, so we'll describe some of those. But at the same time, we'll give you some wider context and explain some more general tuning advice as we, as we go along, uh, so, so rather than have a really dry explanation of some quite esoteric things. Uh, and as a, and the, so, that, so initially, I'll start to describe uh, the, the center of excellence itself. So uh, there's a center of excellence uh, based in EPCC. That's myself and Michael at the moment. You, you may know Tom Edwards and Jason Beach Brown, who used to be very much involved with the, the center of excellence. And the idea is that that both gives EPCC a, a direct access into Cray, you know, a communication route. And also, we have the ability to engage with the Archer user base on various projects. So, and that can be a, a multi-participant uh, project with people outside of EPCC, potentially from other communities using Archer. And we can involve people within Cray in a wider community than, than just the, the staff who are engaged with CEO, CEO Center of Excellences. Uh, and within the Cray environment, uh, there's actually been a change in organization in Europe. So, so Center of Excellence now come under a larger umbrella of a group called the Cray European Research Lab. And other people in that organization have a more research focus uh, to, their, to their roles. And, and for example, some of the current areas of interest for that wider group are things like high performance data analytics, visualization, looking at how we can use things like SSDs and non-volatile memory in a, in a system architecture, uh, looking at frameworks to look at cache and I.O. hierarchies, for example. Uh, so the CUE is kind of a, a part of that larger organization. Uh, and on site, you have uh, myself and Michael at the moment. Uh, <coughs> and we're obviously interested in any research projects or ideas or application-based projects that come out of uh, the Archer user base. So now I'll move on to, to the part of the talk where we'll start to think of What's happened on Archer over around about, say, the last year, or maybe a bit more? What things might you have missed? What new features have arrived? And one part of this are the CLE upgrades. So, so these are upgrades to the basic operating system environment that's installed on Archer. So Archer was installed with something called CLE 5.0, and a particular update of that. And that's been upgraded a couple of times, most recently in December 2015. And what the CLE upgrades bring is they bring potentially a new SUSE version, a new kernel to what's run on the nodes and the, um, and the PP nodes, for example. They bring new libraries, new drivers, updates to kind of low-level software, luster components, network, that kind of thing. Uh, these are generally not user visible. I mean, in some cases, these upgrades bring in the capability to support new hardware. And that's generally not interesting for an existing site. So for other sites, for example, new processor types, new accelerator types, the ability to use SSDs in the system architecture, those kinds of things come in with CLE updates. But there are a few things that are of interest, I think, uh, on Archer. So, so one of them is, is power monitoring. That's something that's been around for quite some time, but has improved as time's gone by. Uh, and the support's got better over recent releases. And, and more importantly, the basic functionality has been there for a while. So this is the capability for you to work out what was the energy consumption of a job based on the energy consumption on a node? And there's both a user perspective to that as something that can be inquired from an application that's running. And then there's a back-end collection framework that does that from the system perspective, from an administration perspective. And that's now all integrated with accounting. Uh, that accounting capability is not currently turned on in Archer, but if we did, 
you, you'd be able to get energy reports from when applications finished. Now, the other area that's of interest, I think, is that a couple of things have changed in the Alps environment that are related to how you launch an application. So one of them is quite trivial. You can now exclude nodes from the, the set chosen by AppRime. That's more interesting to benchmarkers who want to hit the same nodes or avoid a node for some reason. Uh, the second one's a bit more interesting in that the, when you launch an application with AppRime, there are various rules that describe how that application is bound to the set of CPUs available on a node. And there's a new option to, called dash CC depth. And what this does is it takes the the set of resources that have been made available by, by the dash D option in AppRun. So the D option is the one where you reserve threads for a multi-threaded application. What dash CC depth does is it allows your application to wander amongst the set of threads that are available, that have been reserved by, because of whatever the D option was set to. So here's an example where I've got AppRun dash N8, big N4, D3. So each of the processes here would have have a reserved set of three CPUs available to them. And the default binding is something that you see from the picture on the left. So the, the idea of this picture is that you've got CPU 0, CPU 1, and 2. So that's the blue bit, the light blue part. And that's repeated up to the number of CPUs in a node. And at the moment, we're thinking of the first process. So PE0 is long, it has three threads. So let's say you set LMP number threads to three. So you'd have thread 0, thread 1, and thread 2. And the default binding in an app run without the CC depth option would be that the first thread would be bound to the first CPU, the second thread would be bound to the second CPU, and the third thread would be bound to the third CPU. And that would be repeated as you added more and more PEs on the node as they got launched. What the depth option does is within the three CPUs that have been made available, the threads are allowed to just wander. So this is appropriate, for example, if you've got a, say, a, a P threads application where you're going to create more threads than CPUs you've got. Or potentially, if you do something like the Intel OpenMPI runtime, where there's an extra thread, which sometimes makes it difficult to create the right binding. So, so that's an example of a new feature that's come in with the CLE update. So, so now I'll move on to programming environment updates. So this is the piece of the software stack that's more appropriate for applications. So this is the compilers that are available to you, the set of libraries the prog env environment where you can choose a particular compiler, and then the module environments that all are around those. So Cray normally releases one of these, a new version of these environments approximately once a month. But they're not all installed on Archer. So generally, the installation is, well, the installation has only happened during a maintenance session. So if we look back over the last year or so, there was a Cray PE release in January 2015. And that was actually installed on the same month. So Various components of that would have been available to you. So, if an, for example, if a new compiler was introduced, you'd be able to choose that compiler by saying module load or module swap CCE slash 8.3 point something. Uh, but the defaults are only changed later. So what happens is the PE environment is installed, and then there's a delay while, they, while that environment can be tested. There's a test and development system in association with the service. So normally, uh, <coughs> various people check that that software is OK. EPCC checks that all the other modules they support are working OK. And then we change the defaults on the system so that you pick up all those changes automatically when you log in, without having to do the specific module swaps to get those. Uh, there were some intermediate releases that you wouldn't really know about unless you watched the output of the module list command. So in February, March, and April, some releases got installed. But then the November release, is the latest one that's actually installed on the system. So that was installed in December. And uh, we're about, well, we were planning to make that live today. But the, the, the maintenance sessions have been moved around a bit. So I think currently that's likely to happen on the 24th, but I'm not absolutely sure. So, so bear in mind that in this talk, we're going to describe a combination of things that have happened historically that have come around in the last year or so, and things that are about to happen when this release goes live. And of course, you can access that environment by sourcing the dollar EPCCP release in November 2015. So that gets you the environment that will come the default at the point that happens in the maintenance session. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through various aspects of the programming environment. We'll start off by talking about MPI, a really short thing on Shamem, mention some libraries, mention some changes that are quite important to the performance tools module setup, and then something about the compilers. So I'm going to switch over to Michael, and he's going to 
talk about the MPI part of this. Hi, I'm Michael Neff, uh, and as all Harvey already mentioned, I'm also part of the COE. And I'm going to take you to the MPI part of this session now. So our MPI uh, uses MPH3 from Argon, which gives us a good, robust, and feature-rich MPI. And it also has been well tested for high-level features like uh, MPI derived types and so on. We have several enhancements on top of this. We provide some low-level communication libraries, which uh, help you to tune point-to-point uh, -point communication and collectives. And there's also a shared memory device built up on top of the Cray XPMEM. Um, Cray MPI uses the Nemesis Network API module, which is SMP aware, which helps you if you want to do communication between ranks on the same node because this uses shared memory, so you have some uh, memory copy instead of some uh, other sort of communication over the ARIES network, and this gives you higher performance. And this will be supported under all uh, Cray programming environments. So the compiler or linker wrappers will take care of including the correct headers and libraries. Um, well, now let's get a bit to tuning. So. Uh, Quite often you see your application takes a lot of time in communication and uh, you might want to do something about it. And there are several options you can do during runtime. Uh, and there's a lot of environment variables to try, for instance. So what you could do is you could try huge pages. I'm going to talk about that a bit later on how to use it. Uh, you could also try to maximize OM node transfers by doing some rank reordering. Uh, or you could try to use uh, optimized collectives or DMAP, co DMAP collectives, but for the DMAP co collectives, you will uh, need to relink your application. And of course, you can also help the library to get better overlap, for instance, by using non blocking MPI calls. So you would use MPI I send, MPI I receive, or MPI all gather, and so on. Um, for small messages, uh, you usually want to use the Eager protocol, which gives you a good uh, overlap potential. Uh, so uh, you can try to send more data using a small message by the Eager method um, by uh, changing the threshold uh, or sending larger mes uh, smaller messages. But you can simply change the threshold, and you can do some profiling to figure out uh, if you're in the, the range of uh, where you would want to change the threshold or not. Uh, the larger messages use the rendezvous protocol. Um, and it's recommended to post non-blocking receives as early as possible. And uh, therefore, you should consider to use the asynchronous progress thread engine, which might help you to give you good performance. So you might want to try to reorder uh, your code uh, to give more potential for overlap. Uh, so you want to have some local computation or I.O. that can be done while the messages are actually transferred. And maybe you also could consider to add some of the PIGAS languages in some parts of your application. OK, here's a list of useful environment variables. So uh, for performance enhancements, you can, for instance, try to use uh, the collective or uh, add the uh, collective sync, uh, MPH collective sync environment variable. This adds a barrier before your collectives. And you can use this if CrayPad makes your code run faster, which happened for some of the applications. And there are also several reporting features. So you can have a MPH uh, displayed the CPU mask and the bindings of each MPI rank. Um, you can have uh, the MPI library uh, print out all the value of the environment variables by setting the MPH env display variable. You can get some uh, MPI IO stats, uh, which are uh, quite useful for uh, optimization. You can uh, display the rank reordering, and you can also display the MPI version. And there are plenty of more environment variables and much more detailed information available. So uh, if you're interested in this and want to look things up, always consider to check the MPI man page. OK? There are other tunings available. So uh, 
better memory usage at scale uh, by allocating uh, the connection structures at startup, uh, which is now the default, and you could export MPitch dynamic uh, VCS for this. Um, from November 2015, uh, MPI alloc men will now allocate a memory backed by huge pages, which is quite good for uh, performance. And uh, there are also two areas where there have been uh, recent related improvements, and this is the fine-grained threading support and the asynchronous progress support. So uh, with the fine-grained threading support, um, this is for all apps that call MPI within parallel regions, let's say, for instance, within uh, an OpenMP thread. Uh, if you want to do this, uh, you will need to link with a special library with the uh, dash gray mpitch dash mt flag, uh, and then set mpitch max thread safety to multiple, and uh, you also might want to set mpitch version display equals one to see the version and see if everything's correct. And this uh, currently only applies to point-to-point -point calls, and you can check again on the main page if you want to have more details. The asynchronous progress engine uh, can help you in a way uh, that it spawns additional threads. So usually if you're doing uh, communication, uh, you try to place the MPI I receive as soon as possible. And then once you have data, uh, place the MPI I send. And uh, as soon as you or, and then you continue doing some more compute. And after that, you have a wait all, uh, because you need then the data that has been sent. What usually happens is the data uh, is sent in the wait all. So this is usually not what you want, because then uh, the time for the wait all will increase, and you still have uh, the communication time inside of your uh, application profile. Uh, and therefore, these threads can help you because these threads are there in the background. They can, for instance, sit on the hyper threads if you're not using them. And they can help you transfer these messages in the background while the core is actually doing compute. Um, and it can be used to improve communication uh, computation overlap because each MPI rank will start a thing like the Intel helper thread during MPI init. And these helpers will process the MPI messages in the background or the MPI engine in the background while your application actually can do compute. But this only works for uh, large messages which use the block transfer engine. Uh, so it only works for internode messages which are using the rendezvous path, which is then for large messages. Okay, so if you want to use it, uh, you have to set uh, two environment variables on the XC system to do so. Um, you have to set the uh, mpitch nemesis async progress equals one, and uh, also mpitch max thread safety equals multiple. And you also need, of course, some place for the progress engine threads to run on. So if you run on the XC with uh, AP run minus J1, then all the second hyper threads are spare and the progress engine threads will use them by default. So you don't need to do anything else. If you're running with J2, then you need to reserve one or more cores for hyper threads for the progress engine. And you can use the uh, minus R core specialization flag for this. So for instance, if you want to use uh, one core or one hyper thread for this, uh, you use uh, AP run minus N, give the number of ranks you want to run. Then you say, OK, let's use, for instance, uh, 63 uh, ranks per node uh, and have the R1. It's called <coughs> Archer. Yes. <laughs> I know that the, the Archer nodes are smaller, but there are some new nodes now that are out there uh, which have uh, 38 uh, Haskell cores or something like that. And there's also uh, some information if you want to use uh, two cores for this. So the question is, will the progress engine help? Well, it can help for codes that spend a lot of time on large message transfers. 
and that are using non-blocking MBI calls. So it can help, uh, and there are some applications that had 10% or more performance improvements, but there are also other uh, indications why it might not help. So even if you have slow, large message transfers with non-blocking MPI, um, you you had to use MPIG uh, max thread safety equals multiple, and this has performance implications due to locking inside the library, because uh, thread safety means uh, more locking. But uh, there's also some core specialization if you're using the hyper threads, and this means you can use fewer processes per node, so you have less computational power per node. And this also means you have a reduced amount of intranode MPI messages, which uh, might increase the off-node traffic. OK, so um, there are also some BMAP options inside, built inside the library. Uh, there are some new MPI hardware broadcast functions. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, you have to relink uh, with uh, some, some flags in order to enable DMAP if you want to try this. And then you can set MPIG uh, use DMAP call equals one, or uh, you can specify a specific routine you want to use the collectives for, for instance, MPI broadcast or uh, something else. And there's also uh, a new feature, uh, MPIG DMAP all to all areas for uh, DMAP all to all on the areas chip. And uh, DMAP comes with uh, shared memory optimization improvements, which will give you a better performance for the collectives. Here are some uh, useful variables for MPIIO. So there's MPIG MPIIO stat equals two, uh, which you can use to profile uh, the usage of MPIIO. And there's some nice output file you would get out there it uh, displays the number of uh, independent writes, for instance, the number of collective writes, uh, the number of uh, system writes that has, have been done, the number of stripe sized writes, and so on. So you can really get a clue if you look at these, uh, what kind of uh, I.O. is going on in your library. And there's also an uh, MPIIO aggregate replacement display. Uh, which you can set if you want to have some uh, information about uh, the MPIIO aggregators and how they are placed. And you can also use MPIG MPIIO aggregator placement stride in order to set the aggregator stride to uh, what you think is appropriate. OK. And you can also get some really nice pictures uh, out of uh, this MPIIO uh, output. and. Uh, if you plot this, you can really see uh, over the time interval, interval uh, how many writes, for instance, you had, uh, how many independent writes, uh, how many collective writes, collective read, and so on. Uh, and uh, there are some tests that have, have been done with WARF uh, on 19,200 cores. And you see the number of system writes and read in this case. And you really can see there are huge blocks of uh, writes and some blocks of a uh, read in the beginning. And uh, you can also display the number of stripe size aligned system write calls. And uh, this looks good. And this is really quite useful if you want to get some information uh, what's going on in your application, uh, why you're uh, I.O. using MPIO, or uh, also, for instance, parallel NCDF or parallel HDF5, because they use MPIO. So you really can get a hint of what's going on in your application. And this would apply to NetCDF and HDF5 as well, if based on MPIO. Yes. So uh, you, you can really uh, have a look, even if you use uh, NetCDF or uh, MPIO. OK. So uh, what will be coming in the future? Um, the, the December uh, programming environment release uh, will bring you uh, MPIG 7.3.1, which will support MPI 3.1. And it will also support non-blocking MPIIO, which could be quite useful. OK. Uh, I mentioned before that huge pages might help you. 
And there's a reason because the Aries chip will perform better with huge pages than with uh, 4K pages because uh, the Aries can map more uh, pages uh, using fewer resources, meaning uh, your communications may be faster. The huge pages will also affect your uh, transition look aside buffer performance, which means uh, your code may run with uh, fewer TLB misses and therefore faster. But your code uh, may load extra data and so uh, run slower. But the only way to know this is uh, to try it out. And all you have to do for this is uh, load the module uh, create huge pages, uh, any of them, uh, relink your application, and uh, load uh, the module with the size you want uh, again during run times. And the nice thing is uh, you can uh, simply uh, submit a series of jobs in one uh, submit script, uh, just changing numbers, and you can try to out the different numbers. So that's quite easy and convenient. And I did some tests with this. So uh, first of all, I wrote a sample application just doing MPI communication in a massive way. And I was able to, to improve uh, the performance of the application, the total runtime by a factor, or I got a speed up of 1.5. So that's quite nice just for doing nothing. I also took a real-time molecular or real molecular dynamics application uh, and linked it with huge pages and did some tests. And you can see you can get 10% of performance by uh, basically doing nothing but uh, loading a module. And so I want to encourage you to try this. And this is quite easy and uh, quite convenient, I think. So OK. And uh, finally, uh, starting with uh, MPH7, there is a binary compatibility. Uh, and uh, this is part of an initiative involving Cray, IBM, uh, Argonne National Laboratory, and Intel. And this allows a dynamically linked application um, linked with one of the MPI versions uh, to use a different one at runtime. So this is quite helpful for ISB code because you can simply bring it to the system and run it. Um, the Cray compatibility only works in one direction on the Cray XC. So you can run applications built with other ABI compatible versions of MPI on the XC, but uh, you can't take them from there. Uh, and there are some restrictions coming with that. So the applications must be compiled with uh, Intel or GNU compilers. They need to match uh, the operating system version and uh, the CPU architecture dependencies. And you can check this document for full details. And uh, you can use the gray MPH MPI module for that. OK. Then I will hand over to uh, Harvey again. OK, so in the next section, we'll have a we'll think about the performance tools. So this is the path tools module. So if you've not used the Cray performance tools before, the workflow is that you, you compile your, your application in a special way. Once you've done that, you, you're essentially running an experiment. And that experiment can either create a file of information which you post-process, or it can produce some output in standard output. Uh, and the reason we want to talk about this is that as of the version, I think, 6.3.0, the, the latest one that's installed on Archer, but it's not a default, the way the modules that control this are organized has changed. So if you've used Path Tools before, you basically have to build a module called Path Tools or Path Tools Lite, and those were your two choices. Once you did that, you were in an environment where when you compiled an application, you would instrument your application for performance analysis. Now what's happened is that the, the modules have been kind of torn apart a little bit. So it's possible for you to just load basic path tools support. For example, just to get the reporting tool or apprentice, which is the graphical environment, but without the environment, it will affect the compilation. Uh, the other thing that's happened is that the modules have been changed so that the the component called path tools light. So the idea of path tools light is if you load the module called path tools light, you can you just do a one step compile, you run your application and it will produce performance information to standard out. It's not a two-stage process that you might have uh, used before. So, so essentially, there are different modules that you can use. And, and if you do a module swap or a module load of the latest path tools on Archer, 
you'll get a warning that describes this new setup just to, to remind you that the setup's different. So the basic module is called Perth Tools Base, and that would let you run Apprentice, for example. There are various versions of the Perf Tools Lite. So there's a, if you just load Perf Tools Lite, you build an application and you run it, you'll get a performance report based on sampling. Uh, there are some slightly different versions of that that will come on to, and, and you still have the option to load Perf Tools in, in the way that you were used to if you've been doing performance analysis for quite some time. So if you, so for Perf Tools Lite, that's just a default experiment. You'll get output to standard output. Perf Tools Lite events. Uh, it gives you an event profile, so this is a kind of tracing profile. Uh, Perf tools like loops, what that does is it compiles your program with instrumentation for loops in the application. So, so normally with Perf tools, if you do a tracing experiment, you're tracing functions. If you do a sampling experiment, you're getting hits to various points in your program based on a timer. If you do Perf tools like loops, you're specially compiling your program, and it, this only works for CCE, this version. And you're adding an option called Profile Generate, which essentially adds profiling calls around any loop you have in your application. Because typically, things that consume times are things that are run quite often, and they run quite often because they're in a loop. So concentrating performance analysis on a loop nest is usually a useful thing to do. So that allows you to focus on, to, on loops rather than complete routines, for example. Uh, you don't really, so there is a GPU version, but obviously that's not appropriate for Archer. And, and like I said, you can use the traditional mechanism of using Perf tools where you do a pat build process, you instrument a binary, you run that binary, you end up with a, a, a performance experiment file that's got the performance information in it, and then you look at that with either pat report or apprentice. So you can still do the, the traditional way. I think for someone who's starting out on these performance tools and you've never used them before, just load Perf tools light, recompile your application and run it and, and see what you get. And, and the one thing I mentioned at the start was that Alps has, now has the capability to collect uh, energy information about your application. So that's one thing that you'll get if you if you run a Cray Pat Light experiment. So uh, this is a table just showing you energy consumption uh, of, of an application, so minimum, max, and average across the set of nodes. So that's one thing you can look at. The other thing that's quite useful is you get an I/O profile now by default. So you can get a, a, a quick look at what I.O. your application is producing based on, on units. And so that's it for Perf Tools. Really. I just want to let you know that that's a big change, I think, that this new module set up, so just be aware of that. So scientific libraries, well, there's obviously continuing improvements on these, although mainly they're targeting new processor types and sometimes optimizations where people have complained that a particular, you know, matrix operation wasn't going well for the sizes they used, and then the team will take a look at that and potentially improve things. Uh, so the whole software stack changes from time to time. You know, new, new versions of different bits of the libraries, chilling off their Pepsi or whatever. Uh, one change that happened over the last couple of years was that there used to be a completely separate serial library that it was quite not difficult to use, but you needed to especially link your application if you absolutely wanted to use a serial version of the library. That now just happens automatically if you aren't compiling for a multi-threaded application. And that applies both to CCE and the other compilers. The other thing that's changed in the stack is there's been some improvements to global arrays. So one of them is quite esoteric. One is just an optimization of non-blocking accumulate operations, which is controllable by an environment variable. And that, that came out in the November PE release. Something that's coming quite soon is there was a regression in performance on the XC with global arrays that affected NWCAM. And we spent a lot of time investigating that. You know, there was, there was the people from EPCC, users involved, uh, Cray developers involved, the global arrays developers, and, and eventually we've understood it. And there's actually a new implementation of global arrays that's looking quite good. So some of that work feeds into uh, this release. The, the current NWCAM is built OK, but uh, th this is generally available to everybody at some point. The next thing is Shamem. I don't know if you use Shamem, but the, the things have happened over the last while. The, the, there's now a much better implementation if you want to use uh, Shamem from a threaded application. There's some new functionality, so that it now has a team functionality. In, in Shamem, anything beyond global context was a strange thing. It was like a power of two division of your CPUs, but there's now a team capability. There's also a signaling put that lets essentially you do a put with flag, and that's a quite useful thing to do if you're doing Halo sorts. Uh, there's also been some optimizations quite recently that uh, are allowing the Shamem implementation to use the, the, the Ares collection engine, uh, collective engine. 
uh, there's a new variable to control the amount of shared memory that's available to your application. So this is a bit like XT symmetric heap size that you, that's still valid, but applies across all the programming models. And also of the most recent release, the, the December one, uh, the shared memory implementation is open shared memory 1.2 compliant. So the last topic I want to talk about compilers. So, so just a recap on the current and default environment on Arctra, which is this, a version of CCE 8.3. That compilation environment covers C, C++, and Fortran. It's OpenMP 3.1, uh, OpenAct 2 for people who've got accelerators. It includes UPC support. Uh, it's, this version is on the way to C++ 11, so it supports C++ 98 and 2003. And the Cray compilers have been fully Fortran 2008 for quite a long time now, so I tend not to talk about it anymore. But, uh, and if you want detailed information on, on compilers and what's new, there are release notes on docs.cray.com that you can look at. So more specifically, things that came along with 8.3, there was a new option that allows you to basically speed up compilation. So it's not the same as you picking 0, FP0. This just tells the compiler that bits of the compiler phases that are known to be expensive, it dials them back. So this is useful if you're just developing an application and you're not yet looking at performance, but you want the build to be quick. But you don't want to specially craft a new set of options just for that. The other thing that came along was a much stricter conformance to floating point uh, accuracy. So there's a, there's a range of arguments you can apply to FlexMP, and strict is the most strict one. So that was added at a request to some customers. Uh, the other thing, that, and this has gradually been a theme of improvement, is the H concurrent option. So there's a directive called concurrent that basically says all iterations of a loop are completely independent, you know, backwards, forwards, data independent. So this is stronger than IV DAP. And there is, in Fortran, you actually have a do concurrent, but its syntax is different from a standard do. So the, the concurrent here can be quite useful if a loop's not being vectorized because the compiler thinks there's some dependency. There was a change of the module, so the modules are now uh, generated, first of all, so .mod files are generated, uh, so that's now a default. That happened as eight, when 8.3 came in. The other thing that came in that people might not know is, is that you can, for Fortran output, you can have the rank and the thread prefix prepended to any output that's generated. So that can be quite useful for pe testing purposes. And the, and the other thing I think that's quite interesting is that I've been involved with a few customers who were very interested in the, the bounds checking. But the problem was, if you used bound checking on some really large applications, you got so many false positives that it wasn't practical. You might end up with 40,000 false positives. And there's been a lot of work to improve that. So I, I think for new development, I'd really recommend people try these options. But, and that's got even better with the 8.4 compiler that we're about to talk about. And of course, general performance enhancements and debug fixes come along with every release of the compiler. So moving on to 8.4, so you now have access to this. One of the recent PE installs uh, introduced in 8.4. Uh, so that the C++ supports C++ 2011. It, the Fortran supports the latest interoperability standards between Fortran and C. So these are quite interesting things, like you can craft an array descriptor in C and then pass it to Fortran as an allocatable dummy. But, you know, it, it really is to that extent. It's quite, it looks quite nice. Uh, I might do a future webinar on that, I'm still thinking about it. Uh, inline assembler for x86. The, the C compilers now can operate in a GNU compatible mode by default, and, and you can turn that off. The other feature that's quite interesting in Fortran is the ability to initialize data to a signaling man. So if you do that and you turn on traps, your program dies immediately that you, you come across initialized data, uninitialized data. So that was also a request for that. Well, I think uh, Alistair Hart uh, put in a long time ago as a customer request. And there are some things that are interesting for people with mixed CPU environments. You can, you can say that the libraries should constrain themselves to only one of the CPUs available to an application. That's quite important to some people. There's a new way to, dis to say which uh, language standard that's being interpreted at the time. So the defaults are the things in the purple color here. And the, the, the other things you can choose are in a different color. And, and general performance improvements as well. So the next slide is really just to say that this, I, I've never used this, but there are some applications that use the GNU way of doing inline assembler. And here's an example. I stole it from the web. Uh, and it basically, that you inject assembler into a source file, and that's now supported by the compiler. Uh, MILC is one of the applications that does this. You know, QC, I think it's QCD. These people like to do you know, really hardcore assembler stuff. Uh, the other thing that's come in is uh, some improvements to the UPC implementation. And then I guess the big thing with CCE 8.4 is the support for OpenMP4. 
So that means you know the accelerator stuff that people are interested in the accelerators. It supports the affinity control stuff the OMP places. So just be aware that OMP places, as far as I can see, looks really cool until you read the bits in the spec that say what's not defined. So it gives you a kind of standard way to ask for something, but what you get depends on the system. So on the Cray environment, these directives are interpreted in the context of the affinity masks that ALPS gave your application. So, so just be aware of that. And, and obviously, tasking is a big thing, user defined reduction, and it's in directive and cancellation. So those are all new things in, open, in the OpenMP implementation. Uh, I said that 8.4, sorry, it had the HGNU as the default, and there were some subtleties here that could catch people out. So one thing is the order that defined and undefined options are used has changed. So just be aware of that. Try graphs are not supported. I mean, if you don't know what they are, don't look them up. It's just a nonsense, right? And PreCC now, it, it, it incorporates a bug that's been in GNU for a long time just for compatibility reasons. If you care about things like differentiation by linkage, look up this document. So this S5212-84 is a document on the Cray documentation website. A uh, couple of small things. ATP, the, the default behavior has swapped between allowing six term to create a stack trace of your application and allowing it not to. So th that may change with a PE release. So if you, if you care about getting a stack trace at the point your application gets killed by PBS because it ran out of time, uh, look into this at that point. Uh, and and I, I guess we're running out of time, so I'm going to jump to the end now. So, so, so I hope that's been useful. We, we didn't want to just give you little bitty things that had improved, so we gave you a bit more content on the MPI, because there's other things that are generally interesting. Uh, and what we're going to try to do is, is, is if we think something new and interesting has come into the PE uh, environments that are installed that are not about to become a default, we're, we're trying to think of mechanisms to let you know about these things. So uh, I guess. I guess you have to ask questions by chat, because I certainly can't hear, and we only have a couple of minutes, but I'll, I'll hand back to David if he wants to manage that. And I guess if you have any suggestions for future webinars, we'd be interested in hearing them. So I'm, I don't think they're related things, but Michael might have an opinion on this. I'm not sure about that either. So uh, it, it sounds to me like it is, but uh, I can't comment on that. That this actually is a, the the progress engine or not? Yeah. Okay. We we should check that. That's a good question. I mean, you can already do asynchronous I/O just in Fortran. I mean, Fortran 2008 supports asynchronous I/O, and we tested it, and it does work. So and it works in Lustre. Uh, but at some point, you need some system resource to do the thing, right? But that's generally true of any application. It's, it's, it's asynchronously doing an I/O anyway if you've got buffered I/O because at some point the OS goes, I need to transfer that stuff. So in that context, you you maybe don't need to. But if you've fully saturated your node with computation, at some point there has to be a CPU involved in moving the data. But we, we we'll check whether there is an actual requirement to do that to get the benefit of that. Well, thanks for everyone for attending. I think there doesn't seem to be any any more questions, so we'll, we'll watch the window for a couple of, a few seconds more. But uh, thanks, anyway.